Welcome to the Unconsumed Podcast. I'm here with my good friend, Doug Stewart. Doug, welcome to the show, bud. How you doing? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. Hey, so I appreciate you coming on uh, as, despite a couple technical difficulties up here um, early on. So I'm glad we've got that ironed out. But um, I wanted to get you on this podcast because I've known you since college. And we played on the same college basketball team. And when I say play, I mean you played. I watched uh, via the bench. And uh, I just saw such stark contrast in what I've known of you over the span of your life. And that was, A, uh, when I first met you, uh, a six seven phenomenal athlete, highly sought after from a ton of schools in the NCAA to a dramatic shift to uh, working a family business to um, a TEDx speech, which I which was like the cherry on top for me because that's how I knew it had it had gone much further than I was able to to fully account for. Yeah. And then finally, like you've got great things going on. You've got uh, the Off the Top podcast. You've got other things in the mm-hmm. works. You've got uh, a, a Dale Carnegie. Um, uh, training company up and running and then you also do training outside of that that's correct right mm-hmm. okay beautiful yep. so th- you got to reconcile this for me because i knew you as like i said a, a, a basketball guy that was uh, fun loving and not very serious about anything to to what you are now and so reconcile the differences for me man start at the beginning yeah, so so one of the biggest changes that I've had is is that I'm still not really serious about anything. Um, you kind of are. Way, <laughs> I'm just way more sincere. Well, right? I would call that serious. Yeah, like yeah. If so, you mean so, it, right? Yeah. So so one of the things, one of the places, and actually one of my, I call him my non-religious uh, Jewish rabbi. Um, his name's Jason Goldberg. He wrote a book called Prison Break that, that, I, that I, I love. But one of the things he, he does is he makes a distinction between being serious and being sincere. Okay. So the concept of seriousness kind of locks us up and kind of makes, makes, it, makes it hard for us to be creative. Right. Um, but we can be not serious at all and be super sincere about things and um, be much more, more successful. So that's one of, the, one of the big things that has been the most helpful for me is just that state of being, right? Like how can I be really sincere about everything I do? And at the same time, not really take anything but so like serious, right? Open-handed, um, and not having any attachments to outcomes. Just trying to do good work mm-hmm. and do the right thing for the right reason. And 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 then I think when we do that, we can expect the right result. So right. um, let's 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 start with this, Mr. Yeah. Corning. I've got a little bit of a bone to pick with you before we get into the <laughs> into the into my story. And so right. um, the maddest I've ever been at any college athlete in my entire career was me being mad at you at me for what because and you don't even know this no i've never i never had any spat with you i remember yeah. getting in a couple fist fights in practice but that was not with you <laughs> that wasn't with me no 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 I, I didn't care enough to be fist fighting in practice um all right so so here's here's the thing there was there was a time where we had to run our mile and the big the the, the big men had to run at a certain time and the guards had to run at a different time and the guards ran first and you ran your mile in sub five minutes like I th- I, like to this day, I remember it being like 18 seconds. Like I remember you starting in a sprint and not coming out of a full sprint the entire four laps of the track oh, and man. thinking to myself, I am going to murder Lee Corning because he is making me, because I was, first of all, at that time in my, I was, I was on prescription medications for some injuries. So I like not good. I was maybe drinking a little bit. I was smoking. Like I was not ready to run a mile and you come out and run this blazing fast mile from the beginning. And our coach gets so excited Mm -hmm. and it just wasn't pretty. I was so mad. I was so mad that you came so ready for that run. It's funny you mentioned that because I, I remember that. And um, one of our other teammates, Tyler Baker, who will be on this podcast, who I've done a lot of work with over the time, um, my professional career, calls me and reminds me about that. And he's like, you remember that 458 mile? And he, he gets all excited to this day. That's like 10 years ago now. And, uh, well, and it's funny because that was my athletic Super Bowl right there. Like, I, <laughs> I, don't, like, I barely ever played uh, like in the actual game. So like my goal, my role on the team was to be great in practice 
good in the weight room, and occasionally fast on a track. But none of this translated to basketball, so it was all kind of backwards anyways, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad you enjoy it because it really pissed me off. <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's one of the things that kept me on the team, right? Because if I, yeah. don't, uh, if I don't show up in those capacities, there's no reason to keep me on. <laughs> Yeah, that that and GPA kept you kept kept you squarely with a jersey. Hey, hey, I'll take it. I get what you yeah. can. That jersey's Amen. still hanging Amen. up on my wall up here cuz like I said uh, to you in a previous conversation is uh, that was even being on the team given all of the things that had happened in that frame of life was like it was the it was the achievement of a goal that I had set as a very young man. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. uh getting it any means necessary. I would run that mile in three minutes or uh, bench press a record if I had to. It was it needed to yeah. be done. But yeah, well, that's that's so that's, funny you mentioned that. That's it's an, that's an interesting, perhaps an interesting like data point about uh, about potential as well, right? Because mm-hmm. at that time, through through my college career, it was all like I look back and it was the worst time, one of the worst times of my entire life. Like really? I was depressed. I had crazy anxiety like I was I was marginally injured my entire career and I looked at people like you and Tyler's another example and people like Joel who were who's on your who was just on your podcast yeah with so much envy because you had more than one thing right mm-hmm. like it didn't matter if if you would have lost your jersey you would have been like oh man this sucks but you would have gone on and had done your life right right I only had in my opinion I only had basketball mm-hmm. so if that was taken away from me it was oh, like I had so much anxiety about tearing right. an ACL or like messing up or, or getting kicked out of school because my grades weren't good enough. Right. And I looked at people that would have loved to have my position and Me right here. I looked at them with envy, <laughs> right. not the other way around. You know what I mean? Like I would have tra- I would have given someone all of my athletic ability to be able to know that I had potential or a transferable skill somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but I didn't, and the reason I didn't is because when I was like 11 years old, I was diagnosed with all these learning disabilities, deficiencies, and disorders right. um, by the state of North Carolina. Things like narcolepsy, severe dyslexia, I had some sensory, like some touch issues, um, some um, some 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 other weird stuff, and then like ADD, and so essentially I was medicated, put in the back of the room, and just kind of pushed through school, right? So I either went to summer school, or I got pushed through because I was an athlete. Because when I when I was 13, I was this size. I was six foot. I was like I was six 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 seven mm-hmm. as a 13 year old. I could dunk a basketball when I was 13. I started playing really competitive. By the when I, when I was a freshman in high school, um, I was ranked the number four. Um, basketball player in the state of North Carolina, the number four freshman basketball player in the state of North Carolina. So I had wow. all this like stuff going for me, except I knew that I had nothing else other than basketball, right. like no other potential because number one, the test told me that I didn't. Mm-hmm. And number two, I didn't have, I didn't have, I had never earned the right to believe otherwise right. with the exception really of one thing, which was uh, selling. So my, my grandfather had a furniture business and when I was about 12 years old, he put me on his sales floor. And okay. he, he knew that at some point basketball was gonna go away from me. And so he, he used to tell me, if you can sell, you can always make a living. Completely agree. And Yeah, and so he taught, he taught me that. So I'm a 12 year old like selling sofas and mattresses to like you know, adults in Southeast Raleigh. And, um, and so I didn't really see that though as like a transferable skill. I saw that as like, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to have to do that. Right. I want to like have a good career and then go overseas and play for a decade and then come back and do whatever I want to do. Right. Um, yeah. And then, and then I had this huge change. Um, my first year at school, I had to red shirt cause my grades weren't good enough. The NCAA, what the clearinghouse wouldn't let me play. Okay. Uh, and so they made me, they made me make my first GPA, which they said I had to get a 1.8 to meet the high <laughs> collegiate standard for, you know, college athletes. Uh, and I achieved a one four, which they also told me wasn't a one eight. Those not, uh, not quite close. Not quite, not quite. There is a difference for, you know, Matt. <laughs> What do, they, what do they say? Three out of four people struggle with math. So I was, I am one of those. Um, and so they, uh, they, they told me I had one semester essentially to get my, my grade from a one four to a one eight, or mm-hmm. uh, I was going home. Right. And so wow. they, they, they told me to report to my, uh, my advisor's office, uh, Sarah, uh, who, who you may remember. And uh, so I walk into Sarah's office and she 
points at me and like like super angry and she's like you know what your problem is and one thing i've learned is that when when uh i've learned this from my wife when my wife asks me you do you know what your problem is um she's gonna tell you (laughs) like you no need to answer those questions because you you will find out uh, right. Same same was true with Sarah. Uh-huh. And so Sarah asked me and she said, your problem is that you're a victim. And I got this like weird sense of relief that like washed over me because no one had ever told me what I already believed about myself, which was like, of course, I didn't ask for all this stuff. Right. Like, of course, if I could like not be dyslexic or like not have like this attention issue or not have these sensory things or not like. Of, like, of course I would rather not have, like, narcolepsy. Like, of course I'm a victim. Uh, but what she said next and then what she did after that fundamentally changed the traje- trajectory of my life. Right. Which was, you're a victim of your own thinking. Right. Wow. Okay. And that's the that's where it hits home. Yeah. And that's where it really started for me because I didn't want – there was no way I was going to admit that. I was like, nah. <clears throat> right. Like, no. Of course. Like, that's that's not true. And so she told me I would report to her office every day after class. And uh, I, was, I was actually cool with that up front because over the years I had developed this really honed, uh, this really keen skill, almost like the Liam Nielsen skill, right? Like I have a very developed skill and that was the skill of being able to make teachers quit. So like I was cool with like showing up at Sarah's office because I knew that, you know, a day, two days, four days, maybe a week, maybe – uh, but at some point, she's going to quit. Right. I show up the next day in her office. She hands me a stack of colored construction paper and a box of Crazy 8 crayons. And she sits me down at the desk and she says, I'm going to read you your homework and you're going to draw pictures. Whatever, whatever symbols you need to draw that would remind you of what I'm reading, go for it. Now, was there a significance behind the crayons? Because it feels a little demeaning not to give you a pen. I think part of it was the fact that it was a little demeaning. I think right. I think there was a humility, there was a necessity for humility in that in that process. So, and and uh, we, I mean, Sarah and I have actually talked about that process. And she was, and, and I asked her, I was like, it was, it was such a brilliant and like perfectly done uh, process that I was like, where did you get that? And yeah, she was I was like, just going to ask that. She was like, I, I, I read it somewhere. <laughs> like, I was like, like, I was a complete, like, crash dummy. You know what I mean? Like, she's like, I can't do anything else with this kid, so let's see if I can just have him color and see if I can get his confidence up. You know what I mean? Interesting. And, um, yeah, so, so there, there, are, there are some, especially when it comes to people that are, uh, that are dyslexic and have some attention issues and, and some of the other stuff, there is something to uh, the, the texture of things on paper. Like, even now, I'm really sensitive to, like, what I write with. Um, there's mm. some types of like pens that like they make like make my it's almost like nails on a chalkboard right um, and so there's there's just something about the the feel of crayons it's a little more whatever yeah um, so on your on that topic though it's like uh, so this is something that I have I have probably uh, I was gonna say 10 to 15 it's probably more like eight to 12 um, authors and uh, essentially speakers that I dial up yeah. to get that message as often as I can, because it is the one where it's like, where you're failing, look at the parts that are your fault. And it's a, it's a yeah. it's speaking to your own responsibility for yourself. And so yeah. one of the things I hear you say a lot is, is talking about potential. And it's like, what is that? What is potential? It's like, you don't, you don't totally know what potential is or what your potential could be. You just know that you're not doing it. Right. right. And so to narrow that gap between potential and reality, it's, you know, I've found that you can fill a lot of that just simply with responsibility for yourself. And so yeah. for you to get that all in one fell swoop and from an outside source was probably pretty, pretty groundbreaking. It was incredible. I mean, it was, it was something that I had never experienced because I had only failed up to that point. In fact, and some people don't believe this when I tell them, when I never one time looked up my grades. From the time I was in high school to the time I was in college, I never looked to see what grade I got on anything because right. my grades never told me anything good about myself. So, like, why would I just Why would look? I look? Yeah, yeah, why would I look? Mm-hmm. And um, that was the thing that was the most groundbreaking for me um, because by – so doing that every single day, by the end of that semester, it came test time. 
And over that time, my confidence went up. I got a little more comfortable in class. I got a little more, um, I was I was more willing to talk to the professor instead of the girl sitting beside me, right? Like right. I, I started being a student almost by accident, right? Like I wasn't even like setting out to do this. I was just doing the things that were, that were coming a little more comfortably uh, to me. And so at the end of the semester, I'm literally in the computer lab by myself because everyone else has gone home, but I had to stay and wait for grades to be posted to know whether I could go home or whether I needed to pack my stuff because I wasn't going to get to come back. Oh, wow. And, and so I, I click, that. yeah, so I click view grades. And for the first time, I realized that that 1.4 had gone up to a 3.4 in a you, semester. You gained two points. That means you got a lot of A's. Yeah, I got only A's. Like really? I went from a one four semester to a three four semester. Wow. So all I was trying to do was a one eight, right? That's and incredible. I got a three four and I'm like, holy cow. So I had to admit that Sarah was right, which was hard. Right. Because I didn't want to admit that I was the problem, that I was causing all of this turmoil in my life. Mm-hmm. I wanted to blame it on outside circumstances or, you know, cards I had been dealt or whatever else. Right. And it just wasn't true. You know what's, what else is really wild about that realization, and I've come across this a couple times in my own little track, is when you realize that you can do it, then it's heavy because you have to. it's so much work and you have to keep doing it yeah. in order to realize that potential and grow it further, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that kind of stinks too. Like, can we find something that doesn't stink here? Because <laughs> I'm like, I deal with this all the time and it's when I, when I uncover a little bit of gold in my pursuit of gold, I guess, and figuratively, is that I know there's more gold deeper and I yeah. gotta keep going further if this is gonna, yeah. if I'm gonna realize that potential. So yeah, yeah that's killer, man. Yeah, so here, here's the interesting thing. I got that one four, the next, I never had that, I never achieved that GPA again. Really? I went, so, I went down between two eight and three zero, like like that. Well, those, um, are, great, those all, are great grades. They're, they're great grades, they're not three four. Right. They're two eight. You know what I mean? And so I and, and om, it was almost deliberate because once I realized like, oh, oh, I could I could get a three five, I could get a three six if I wanted to. Mm-hmm. And then I started thinking like, okay, so where where is it gonna be the most valuable, most profitable for me to spend my time? Mm-hmm. So I, I stopped worrying so much I, I I stopped worrying so much about the grade and started worried about my development. So I started mm-hmm. reading books like um, how to win friends and influence people, like um, Napoleon Hill stuff, like Zig Ziglar stuff, like Tony. Like I started reading stuff that would be helpful to me because I realized I was so deficient in so many areas that school wasn't the end game for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So like some of the best advice I ever got in my entire life was C's get degrees, and and you can get out there and just if you know what else is beyond this essentially a gate that you yeah. have to go through um, yeah. whatever it takes to get through the gate and so yeah uh, yeah it, it's school isn't the end and so I think when you're in it it does it can feel like the end if you're going to Harvard or Yale or uh, Stanford or one of those great schools then yeah it matters a lot but for the rest of you know unless you're off the charts IQ and ACT scores and SAT scores are are there then it's for the rest of us it's a it's a river you just got to get through it yeah and then you can go out on the other side I don't I can't tell you how many people I know that what they're doing in their career has nothing to do with what they studied in college can you does not can you think of one time in college where something was written on a chalkboard or on a projection screen and you were like I know it now and I'm gonna use it ten years from now the one thing that I remember that that I think was the most helpful is in one of my classes we put on a golf tournament. Okay. <laughs> and so it was our responsibility to go. We went out and we sold, you know, we we sold sponsorships, and then we we'd go out. So instead of going to class, we would work on the project. So it was like a semester long project. Okay. So it's like we put it, it, we put together this event, and we raised money, and we did this, and we did that. That was like the the most helpful thing, like. For sure. I mean, there, there, there's certainly value to education, right? And if you're going to specialize, like, look, if, 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 here's an example. Mm-hmm. Like three months ago, I had to get a root canal. I want a dentist who got A's. <laughs> like, I right. don't want, I don't want like a one a C's get degrees dentist. dentist. Yeah. I don't want a C's get degrees. So there's some things that's like, yeah, like 
the guy that's pushing the button for NASA, like that that that's making sure that this rocket's going to take off. I want that character to be like cum laude, like a hundred percent. But the dude that's going to start a business or go out and be an entrepreneur, not only does he not need to get A's, perhaps he might not even need col- like he might not even need it. Right. And so yeah, and we've talked about this on a couple different podcasts that I've done is like for for those hyper specialized positions. Yeah, doctors, lawyers, mm-hmm. um, you mentioned dentists, hyper specialized things. Rocket rocketry has not come into it, but yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, but for everyone else, it's like we're all going through the same process and that guy that is is practicing medicine is going through a lot of the same school that someone that is you know, trying to sell software is going right. through and coming out with a boatload of debt, right? And so yeah. I have major problems with that and I'm trying to sell it in my house that uh, my kids will go to internet college <laughs> Yeah, because it's cheaper, you get all the same stuff. And I hesitated to say um, that I didn't get anything great from college. There was a few great professors that turned on a light in my brain of like, okay, it's possible. And that's one of the things this podcast is about is like, you can do almost anything. Yep. Here's here's yep. a bunch of stories on how it got done, and then further uh, an accounting course. And I was poor. Uh, I was very poor at accounting, but it taught me what I needed to know. And I don't think I would have found that out any other way. Yeah. So yeah. there there is some value, but it's nothing that you would have to go 100k into debt for. No, I, the, I'll tell you the the one thing that I would have been willing to go into debt for for college is is that. Is the is the oh. person I married? Like Mama that's Dukes. it. Like yeah. <laughs> like that's college was a great place to find a wife, and that was the best thing I got out of college. <laughs> um, other otherwise, like sure. And and the truth. How old are your kids? My kids they're su- are they're super young, right? I got a two year old boy, and I got uh, twin girls that are seven months. Bro, college might not even exist by the time they get there. That's why I'm selling it now, man. I might even get the deal on a long enough sec- cycle. <laughs> yeah, you you might not even have the choice for cut. Like that's a different conversation, right? But have one 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 resource for that is um, Seth Godin wrote a manifesto called "Stop Stealing Dreams." That's just brilliant, brilliant. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So that might be something. Send you, me the link to that up. after this, and yeah, I'll yeah. put it in the little description. Okay. Cool. Perfect. So yeah. we left off at college, and you're you're having these turning points. Your GPA is turning around. Then. Where do you go from there? Because I'm I'm remembering this, um, like I said, from a distance, and it's yeah. D- Doug's happy go lucky. Doesn't seem to care that much. A phenomenal athlete, maybe underachieving a little bit, uh, but then there was a stark change where you became essentially uh, a different guy. Yeah, yeah, completely different. Almost almost reclusive. <laughs> um, I, I really withdrew from a lot of my relationships. Um, I, I wasn't I wasn't hanging with really the same people. I wasn't hanging really with anybody because I was in this space of like, okay, so now I've got to figure out. Now that I know that I'm the problem, I've got to figure out how to fix it because mm-hmm. one thing I've noticed is that everywhere I go, there I am. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right. So so, so, so I, I've got I, to fix this. Right. So I have a buddy who t- who says this occasionally, and he says um, he says his name's Taylor. He says. Um, the person that you listen to the most is you, yeah. right? And so yeah, yeah, yeah. I had never heard that, and it just kind of like struck me as like, yeah, I talk to me all day. And sometimes, yeah. based on the influences I'm taking in, I start giving myself pretty bad advice, or pretty good advice. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. okay, that, so you're, in, you're, in fact, that's, you're learning this all. That's one all. of the things we talk about too, yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to figure this thing out, right? Like, I'm trying to figure out, right. like, how, how do I change the parts of me that need to change without me just being like a completely an into, inauthentic version of who I am, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I, I got really serious into mentorship. I got really curious. Um, and essentially, I started holding every belief I had like with open hands, like mm-hmm. like complete, like loosely, all of my beliefs became completely loosely held, specifically about who I was and what my potential was. Right. And uh, ended up going home, graduating early, uh, getting engaged, going home, and uh, and going into the family business. Uh, apprenticed for like eighteen months, bought the business, uh, ran, started running the business. Uh, like three, four years later, uh, my grandfather, who was the the founder of the company, passed away. 
uh, there was some disagreements in the family. Mm-hmm. I gave the biz- I ended up giving the business back, not selling it back, literally just walking away from that inventory and assets. And that was the same month my uh, daughter was born, our first kid, uh, which was the same month that my wife quit her job to be a stay-at-home mom. So we lost right. like 70-something percent of our income in a 30-day period Right. and started over. So um, can you tell yeah. me real quick, like you got out of college and there was a business available to be purchased. How did you raise the capital to, to fund that? Um, luckily, I had a, I had a uh, it, w- it was like a top line deal with my grandfather. Okay. Um, and so, so he, he allowed me the opportunity to, he, he self-financed it essentially. And so I had a, I had a, no- a weekly note to pay. Um, and so there was, uh, luckily I was able to sort of strike a deal where I didn't have to go go into debt to, to do this. Okay. And so I, I worked at the company for, you know, 18 months, um, low, low wage, learned the business, worked in the warehouse, worked on the truck, uh, worked on the sales floor, worked in the office over an 18 month period, really did a, like a real apprenticeship, um, mm-hmm. really learned and understood the business. And then, uh, on a weekly basis, I owed, I owed grandpa some, some, some dough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's it like and I asked that question pointedly because you know one of the things we try to identify on this podcast is like what tactical points occurred that you actually acted on that got you going and that seems like yeah. a pretty um pointy in time but then you gave it back. Yeah. Just walked away. Yeah. For yeah. nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Some, okay. Some sometimes the juice isn't worth the squeeze. All right. Um, I, I found that that's not what I wanted to do with my life. Um, there's not there was nothing wrong with it. It was a perfectly good you know living and good work and honest work and everything was cool. Um, mm-hmm. I was just like dying inside. Like I got to this new plateau where I said like, okay, then perhaps my potential isn't going to be found in the four walls of this business. Right. And I didn't really have a lot of ambition to have multiple businesses, multiple locations, and just didn't just wasn't into it. My heart wasn't into it. Right. Um, I, I had I went through some some kind of spiritual discovery over that that point in time. Um, really started changing my my view of of what was worth doing. I was working six days a week, working my face off. I was delivering in the day. I mean, selling during the day, delivering in the evenings. So wait, 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 um, wait. So you were selling the furniture, like in the store in the suit, being like. Here's the new recliner. It's got these kind of coils and so on and so forth. And then you were showing up at their house later at night with, with the bro, couch. Bro, sometimes sometimes <laughs> it was more than that. Sometimes it was they would come in. I would sell it to them. I'd say, hold on one second. I would put it on a dolly. I'd take it to the truck. I'd pull to the front of the door and say, I'll follow you home. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I would buy. I would buy sofa from you anytime. For the record. Yeah, yeah. So I have me and another character on the truck. We would just we just follow you right to the right to the house. Get it awesome. get it done. Oh yeah. It was that kind of like and like that Gary V level, like get get it done, grind it out. And what I found was is that's just not the life I wanted. Like it, it wasn't the legacy I wanted to leave. It was the legacy my grandfather left me. Like he right. worked and and uh, one of the one of the trends in my family, really both sides is our men just work until they die. Like yep. we don't retire. <laughs> we just we just keel over. Like it's just mm-hmm. it's just how it it's just how it happens. And that's one of the things that I wanted to change for for my kids is I like I want to have breakfast with my daughter. Like mm-hmm. I want to be at her play. Like I want to be able to do stuff. And right. if that means me making less money, like okay, so be it. Um, sometimes I don't think you have to make that trade. Sometimes you do. Um, but I, I, I believe make, in making the right trades. Yeah, making that decision early has set you on a different track, right? A hundred percent. There's there's gigs I've worked where it's like, yeah, we can make a lot of dough, but uh, we're all going to die in this chair right here. A hundred percent. And like my family has the same thing. Like I don't think anyone with the last name Corning, uh, that's a male, has made it past, uh, you know, 55, 60 in yeah. several generations. And, uh, you know, that's... Not super cool. <laughs> no, no, no. And that's one of the things I think about a lot is, is how do we honor the people that came before us, right? So right. 
most of the time what happens is we just like elevate them to like sainthood. Right. And we talk about them like they were like inerrant and they never did anything wrong or they never mm. made any mistakes. And we, we really want to honor those people. And one of the things I teach in, in one of my talks is the best way we can honor the people that came before us is to honor the things they did well and then learn from the things they weren't able to teach us. Right, the things that they didn't know. Like we can look at we I can look at the behavior of people that came before me and say, Ah, like that's not something I want to repeat. Right. And yeah. not repeating it is honoring to the highest degree the generations yeah. that came before us. Dude, I like how you uh, you you spin that around to make it something that is you can still learn from all the bad things too. Or like the things that not necessarily even bad things, maybe less than uh, the best potential yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, just the things they couldn't teach us. Like, and there'll be stuff like here's here's my parenting philosophy. You, you, we, our kids are similar age. I, my daughter's six, and we're gonna have a we're gonna have a son in September. Um, okay. Here's my philosophy. I'm gonna do the best I can with the tools that I have, and when she's 21, I'm gonna apologize. <laughs> like that's it. I did my best. That's it. I'm gonna do the absolute best I can, and then nothing held back. I will. I will make an apology when she turns 21. <laughs> Maybe I'm sorry where I messed up. I did yeah. the best I could with the tools that I had to work with, and now you have an opportunity to go do a little better than I did with your kids. Right. Yeah, man. That's you know, it, it's one of those things where it's you know, it's a it's it's still touching back on that initial responsibility. It's like I'm responsible. You know, maybe I didn't do everything right, and I'm I'm worried. I worry about this a lot too. So like, I've spent so much time just like sitting at my desk pondering the uh, the coming of age story of the next generation because it's yeah. going to look a lot different than ours did, and it's so. going to look a lot different than our parents did, and it's like, what's it going to be like? Yeah. How can you how can you set people up for success in that? And I don't have the answer, and the answer is you probably can't. Right. But uh, you know, and maybe. Maybe an apology at 21 is my best play. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, here's, here's, here's another parenting story for you. So when Meredith was, was pregnant with Kendall, I had like this huge like meltdown. Like I, I, I didn't know how to raise a kid and I didn't okay. feel equipped to be a parent. And so the only thing I knew to do was I went to this bookstore. Is a, there's a used bookstore that used to be in Raleigh. It was called... Uh, uh, Half Price Books. Called, no, 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 not half price books. I think it was called Howard McKay or Har- it was Harvey McKay. Harvey okay. McKay used bookstores and it was in uh, North Raleigh. And I went and I bought like 14 books on parenting. Like I was buying books, like she was pre- like the baby wasn't born. I was buying books like about how to like being a dad to a toddler, being a dad to a teenager, like raising an adult. Like I was like doing the whole gamut, like right. not just like how to be a good dad to an infant. And so I was talking to a mentor and I, told him that like like I just went and bought all these books and he was like what'd you buy them for I was like I'm, I really want to be a good dad mm-hmm. and he goes there's nothing in those books that are gonna that's gonna help you be a good dad you you will get nothing out of that purchase right and it kind of like like it sort of hurt my feelings right it's like I just went and spent all this time and all this money I'm buying trying. All these books yeah right. and he says here's the thing about being a good parent he said the books won't teach you anything it's the mm-hmm. fact that you were willing to go buy the books that already make you a good dad. Yeah, it's a mentality for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was just like a big eye-opening experience for me that sometimes it's not about knowing the answer, it's about having the right intent. Mm-hmm. And then moving toward that intent with an like with with open-handedness to be able to say this is the best I have. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I I I want to be better. I want to do better. This is the best I can give you right now. And so you use the term parenting. You use the term open-handedness a couple times here do you have is that from something or is that something that you've coined or what do you mean exactly I, when you say that i don't know if i got it from somewhere i don't know if i made it up um it it feels like a made-up word um so i may have made it up um well, but I'm it also maybe from something else yeah um it's it's just the idea and this is how i try to live my life with with the idea that everything that i have and everything that i every blessing or curse that 
crosses my path, it's, it's just washing over me, right? Like if I'm able to do something good for someone, it's only because I've been equipped by something else. Like mm-hmm. things are just passing through me, like the money that I make or the, the, the good stuff that I do or charity that I do. I, I couldn't do, I couldn't do that if I hadn't been given these other opportunities or been able to do this right. other stuff. So I don't, I don't hold tight. I don't hold anything clinched. Like, okay. Interesting. It's just, it's, it's a stressful way, in my opinion, it's a really stressful way to live. Um, and, and I think that, you know, like, in, in fact, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is that uh, just, the, just the, the devastating nature of certainty, like mm-hmm. in anything, right? Like when we've decided that we know for sure, without a shadow of a doubt, universally, that this is right, no matter what it is, no matter whether we're talking about religion or politics or business or whatever it is, then we're really in a vulnerable place to really get some stuff wrong. Yeah. And so yeah. you ever hear that Twain quote where he says, uh, it's not the things you don't know that are the problem. It's the things you know for certain that just ain't true. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. it's true. It's true. It stings. It stings, man. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it does. It does. And so, so I've, I've let go of I, I, tr- I continually try. I don't know that you can ever get to the point. Uh, I continually try to let go of certain the, the belief of certainty for almost almost anything. Um, mm-hmm. And I leave room to say, like, this is the best I have. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sorry. <laughs> but, and it works because it's, yeah. uh, you know, technically it, it, it works because there's, I guess I'll have to think about this more. It it works because of the fact that it's nothing can really go wrong with it. Does that make sense? Right. It's like if you come with a mentality like that, I mean, uh, it works. I'm going to think about that more. I'm going to call you later on that. So we left you yeah. after you just had left the furniture business. You, yeah. you, you bought it. You gave it back for nothing. What happens after that? So then I went in, if I was hustling in the furniture business, I put hustle into the like hyperdrive because mm-hmm. what I told, you know, we took like a 70% pay cut. Meredith quit her job to be a stay at home mom. I left the business. We lost a ton of assets in that transition. I took an entry level outside sales rep job for a company called Tempur-Pedic, uh, the mattress company. Okay. Um, and, and I told my wife to give me two years. So in two years, I'll get us back at least financially stable. Uh, because we weren't very stable at, at that point, uh, right. and we had a new mouth to feed, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, so I started hustling my absolute face off. I was at Tempur-Pedic for two years, took a couple of promotions, got to a place where I couldn't, I didn't have a lot more, um, a lot more quick movement there. And so right. I left that job, went to another job in, in retail, took a pretty, pretty good. Um, uptick in in pay left that job um, took another one uh, got us back financially s- sort of stable where we could we could uh, enjoy the lifestyle that we had originally sort of become accustomed to and in five years I had six jobs oh wow um, each each one strategically like moving m- moving closer to where I want to be with the exception of one I got laid off um, from from one. Um, uh, you're nobody until you got canned at least once, man. Oh yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I'll tell you this: this, this, this surprises people. I have never been more excited than the day that I got laid off. I was so thrilled. I call garbage. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. This is something that my my wife tells this story because she still thinks I'm absolutely outside of my mind for mm-hmm. this. Um, so I got it was it was snowing. Okay. I was, I was a state away. Uh, it was snowing the entire way. Uh, I drove up there early for this meeting, got laid off in the meeting, called my wife on the way home, ecstatic. I had thir- I had I only had thirty days of severance, okay. and I was like, dude, this is the greatest thing of all time, because I get to go figure, I get to go find something that I like to do better. Like this is awesome. Right. Okay. And and so for thirty days, it was my full time job to find something that I wanted to do more. And so that's what I did and landed somewhere that I was way happier, way like it was, it was all, like, that was the, like, and I, I had a job in like two weeks. It didn't take 30 days. So I had a little, I got, and I even got to double dip a little bit with severance in, 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 in the new job. But mm-hmm. it was, it was so cool because, and here's the other thing I've like, I'm so used to failing. Like my, my education, if it taught me anything is this, is that the failure doesn't kill you. 
Right. Like failure is just opportunity, right? And so I was like, yeah, I got this huge opportunity. They let me go. Like, yeah. And they're going to pay me for like, they're going to give me a severance. This is awesome. Right. <laughs> right. And so um, luckily, and one of the things that led to that was that same time in 2011, just after I left the business, we had our daughter uh, and I started this entry level position, I got an opportunity to take the Dale Carnegie program. And so the Dale Carnegie program was a huge, like everything that Sarah and college had, had done for me in terms of my attitude, right. uh, the Dale Carnegie gave me skills and methods, models, structures to be able to put that attitude in so, mm-hmm. that, I could, so that I could recognize or acknowledge my potential in, in new and more dynamic ways. Uh, and so that's, I was off to the races. And I, I, was, uh, I went back nine consecutive times as a, <laughs> as a graduate assistant to the Dale Carnegie program. Uh, then I went on a two-year apprenticeship, and then I went on another uh, couple of years of um, learning to become an instructor. And then, where are we, 2018? The end of 2016, I went full-time as a Dale Carnegie, uh, as, as a Dale Carnegie kind of like contractor. Okay, interesting. So I've heard a lot about this over time. Um, one thing that comes to mind when I hear the Dale Carnegie thing is... Uh, that's it's it's built around the how to win friends and influence people story, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Can can you describe it to um, people that might not be familiar with what that is? Yeah. So so how to win friends and influence people was written in like the 1930s. The program actually started before that. So um, oh really? In, ni- in 1909, same year that the Titanic sank. Um, Mr. Carnegie started holding public speaking classes at the New York City YMCA. Okay. And uh, he over over and it took him 25 years to write the book. And one of the things he cited as saying is that there's not a, not one of his original ideas is found in the book. It's all things that he researched other successful people and simply wrote it down. Right. And so over the course of 25 years, he researched what do the most successful people do, and how do they become more successful. And so mm-hmm. it was. It, it ended up being. It it what it really ended up doing, Lee, is it ended up operationalizing the golden rule. Like when you when I think about that book, that's what it does. It says, okay, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the golden rule. Now, how do you actually do that? Right. Well, you become genuinely interested in other people. You smile. You you allow other people to talk about them their themselves. You never tell people they're, that they're wrong directly. You don't argue with people. You, you know, it's, it's all things that are, are fundamental. It's, it's all things that our great grandmas would have told us. Mm-hmm. The Saving the wisdom is, of the past, right? Yeah. The only thing is, is we don't do those things. Right. Right. So there's, a, there's, al- there's almost always a gap between what we believe and what we do. Right. So like, right. I know that it's important to eat healthy. And then I eat four Oreos at 1030 at night. You know I must I mean? have had so, 15 last night, man. <laughs> yeah, so like, so where's the gap, right? So there's, some, right. there's something that's keeping me from living consistently with what I believe. And oftentimes, right. it's experience. We've never taken the time to sit. Because, I mean, our lives are so fast-paced. We've never taken the time to just sit down and go, okay, so here's what I'm doing. Here's what I believe. Let's see if we can get those two things a little closer together. Yeah, and so there's there's a polar opposite to that, which is people that, you know, we, we look at um, people that have so much going on where they don't take time to have that thought process. And then yeah. on the other token, you've got people that have nothing going on. Right. And they also refuse to do that process. Yeah. So it's like, it's an, it's an everybody thing to operationalize that rule. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Interesting. And, and, Something people ask me a lot is like, this book was written, like this program's over a hundred years old. Like, yeah. is it still relevant? And if it is, like, how could it possibly be relevant? Mm-hmm. One of the things Mr. Carnegie did that was so brilliant is he didn't deal in techniques or tricks. He dealt in human nature. Right. Right. And so for the last, you know, 500 years, human nature hasn't changed at all. Like, I we're would still t- the I same. would take it. Further than that, I was just having a conversation with my buddy Ben Zolden, and we kind of look at these things as natural laws that have occurred yeah. throughout history. And I would say that they go back as far as you want to put humans on the earth. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And and it will be true until the robots take over. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Like it's right. we're not gonna as human beings, our nature doesn't change. We're just as human as generations before us. We're just as human as generations to come. Mm-hmm. And so the question the question is is how do we continually, actively, and deliberately become more human? And that is the Dale Carnegie process. Yeah, so I was just having an AI conversation. You really got me spinning now, man. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so so I've read that book when I was a young guy, and I borrowed it from a buddy because I thought it would be great if I had more friends, and I, that's why I picked it up. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And I didn't. I don't like. I I ended up not really being about that. It's about you know a, a myriad of other things. Yeah. And so. Um, is the Carnegie training what really spun you on to the TEDx talk? The Carnegie training is what gave me the structures to be able to deliver my story. Mm-hmm. So, so my story is really the story of um, essentially learning disabilities all the way through college, having that breakthrough, and then and then my path to mentorship and kind of a and a very. Um, a, a very different way of thinking about mentorship. So when mm-hmm. I think about mentorship, my idea isn't so much as from a mentor's perspective, it's more from a mentee's perspective. How do we how do we learn, develop and grow from everything and everyone around us and and not think about mentorship like the devil wears Prada. You know what I mean? Like like there's one person with all the power and we have to like do everything they say and they treat us like garbage and one day we get to be the person with power and treat everybody else like garbage like Right. I took a very different approach. And so the Dell Carnegie program gave me the, number one, gave me the confidence to start speaking. Number two, gave me the structure to tell my story in a compelling way. And then number three, gave me a place to really practice and, and hone my skills. So let me ask you this. And so like one of the things we talked about in this podcast is we define tactical points, as we've already mentioned. When you go to apply to do a TEDx talk, how does that look? Do you go in there with something canned, ready to go, or do you go in there and try to fit a narrative, or what do you do? How does that get done? Yeah, so so people people ask me that a lot. I I think I kind of hacked my way in. Um, in as in, as as a as a ex furniture sales guy would, right? <laughs> yeah, I sold my way in. So so here's here's so TEDx events are independently run. And right. so all of their application processes can have some, some little variations. So mm-hmm. the advice I give people is, um, is, is don't have it all decided. Don't know exactly what the talk is. Um, have your idea. The idea is the most important part. Right. Um, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then map the idea to the theme. So every single event has a different theme. Mine in particular um, for TEDx Raleigh 2016 was Wonderlust. And so I mapped my idea of mentorship to the, to the concept of wonderlust. So essentially what, what I had to do is I had to do a, I had to do a written application mm-hmm. and then a two-minute video and then wait. Um, and then you would get a call. And then if you got a call, you'd have a Skype interview. And if you had a Skype interview and you got approved from that, you would get invited to uh, the announcement party. And then the announcement party, you would find out whether you've been selected or you hadn't. So that was kind of our process. Um, Interesting. So is it like yeah. a huge bummer to have all the people there that didn't get it? No. <laughs> Excuse me. Would it no, have been a no. huge bummer if you went and then you didn't get it? Yes. Would you have been really bummed out to be there? Uh, yes. But that's what I'm thinking. Like, well, it's not the, audience, it's not the type of thing that of I go to. Be hacked. Yeah, it's it's not the type of thing I go to anyway. So like, I right. don't enjoy those sorts of things, and so I would have been like, oh, this is lame. Let's like, I'm out. Like, see ya. You right. know what I mean? Um, luckily, I so so here's how I hacked the process. So I was I started looking at the TEDx franchises around me to see if I could perhaps put on and host a TED event. Okay. Because it seemed it seemed congruent with my business, right? With the Dale Carnegie business, it seemed congruent to ho- for Dale Carnegie to uh, in Raleigh to host a TEDx in Raleigh. Just it kind right. of it kind of matched, and so uh, I started doing some research, and I found that the last event hadn't happened. It didn't happen last year. It happened the year before, right? And so, and so what I did was I started going online and trying to figure out like who was the contact person. So then I found their Twitter handle, and it just so happened like hours before. Uh, they had tweeted that they're going to have a volunteer uh, like get together to talk about 
the upcoming TEDx. So I was like, sweet, I'll just go to that, and like see what's up. So right. I go, I'm, I meet, there's like 40 to 50 people there. I meet everybody involved. They asked me if I'd like to be, because of my position with Dale Carnegie, they said, well, would you like to be on the speaker selection team to mm-hmm. pick the speaker? I was like, oh, that sounds cool. I could be a part of this and see how it runs. So I show up to the speaker selection thing, meet everyone on the speaker selection meet, team. <laughs> and like, I'm just kind of jamming with them and they're talking about what they're looking for. And I'm like, yo, like, I think I've got to talk. Like, How about me? I, I think I've got a story. And so the next morning, I call the curator, and I go, hey, bro, I've got to, I've got to drop out of the selection team. He was like, why? And I said, well, because I, I, I think i got a story. I need to be selected. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I was the only person that everyone on the speaker selection team knew. Right, so I kind of, mm. in some way, like inadvertently, like I wish I was smart enough to have like gamed the system like that. <laughs> and... I, I I may maybe if I wouldn't have done that I still would have gotten an opportunity to give the talk. Right. Maybe I would. would you, maybe I you would. got selected. Who yeah. Who, who knows? Yeah. 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 Who knows? Maybe, yeah. maybe that's the only reason I got a TEDx talk, mm-hmm. and maybe I would have gotten picked anyway. Right. And so the the best advice I can give people that are are wanting to give a talk. Number one, it was a fundamental change in my career to give the mm-hmm. talk. Like unbelievable. The credibility that comes from that is un un uh, unbelievable. Right. Like Um, when I saw that, I knew that the change I had seen had hit a certain point, right? Yeah. 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 So if, if you've got an idea and you can map that idea to the, to the theme of that year's TEDx in Mm -hmm. your area, and you can can tell a compelling story as to why those two things match up, you've got a pretty good chance. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the next thing you got to do is get coaching, right? So, so once you get picked, they give you a TEDx gives you a coach. Luckily, I had my Del, my whole Dale Carnegie mm-hmm. community to coach me, and so it was it was it was really good for that for that standpoint. The, the Dale Carnegie squad rolls deep. Rolls super deep. That's what yeah. I'm talking about, man. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the fam. Yeah, yeah. I love it. Okay, so tell me about so that that was an awesome process, and then tell me about um, the what came after, right? So like you're saying, this inspired a bunch of notoriety. And it gave you uh, credibility. And so, what what did you do after that? So about about two weeks. So it takes. So once the event happens, it can take anywhere from like a month to like three, sometimes five month, months for your talk to show up on on the YouTube channel, on the TEDx mm-hmm. channel. So there's like a there's like a wait. Uh, and so the event was just like crazy good. Like the the crowd was like unbelievable. And then like right. two weeks after the event, I get a call from this association, this lady that runs this, this association, she goes, hey, uh, I saw your, that you just gave a TEDx talk. And I said, yeah. She said, uh, well, one of, our, one of the things we're really focusing on this year is mentorship. What, what's your fee? And I was like, oh man, what's my fee? And I was like, where's it at? And she was like, oh, it's local. So what's your local fee? And I was like, dang, I don't have a fee. So I just like threw out an arbitrary number. And she was like, oh, that, that sounds great. We'll do that. Let's, let's book it. And I was like, dang, I didn't, ah, man, I didn't charge enough, right? <laughs> and so, and so, um, so it was crazy that like there's just an assumption that like you're a professional public speaker because you have it. To, and and I, had, I had really oriented my business to deeper work, more one-on-one work, small group work, and had mm-hmm. never really wanted uh, honestly, to be like a keynote speaker, because I wanted to be more relationally with my clients, right. and not just like fly in, do a song and dance, and take a check and fly out. And so um, that really started my that really started my keynote career. And then so I got my I I ended up raising my price um, for for keynoting. Yeah, I was going to um, ask like, tell me, can you tell me what? Like if you're, if I was going to tr- go try to be a speaker, like what would be an initial entry level rate? So I, I thought I was like, I thought this was the craziest number of all time. And I didn't care like whether I got it or not. So I was like, I'm right. just going to throw out this crazy number. So when she asked me, I said, uh, $2,000. And she's right. like, yes, well, of course we'll do that. Done. I was like, oh my gosh. And so essentially what I, what I did was, um, I just because I didn't know the market, I raised my price by $500 every talk I gave. Okay. Until the market punched me in the mouth. <laughs> and, right. Um, I always say get yeah. two no's before you get a yes, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so at, at at some point the market's like, nah, bro, you're not you're not worth you're that not much. That good. And so yeah. so then you just drop it back down and then you roll there. Um but but the, the, the truth is is that 
um, I, I was very and still am very deliberate about not being a keynote speaker. That's that's I, I do keynote speaking to drive other parts of my business and to raise awareness for other parts of my business. Mm-hmm. Um, but dude, I just I, I want to tuck my kid in. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I want to I want to have breakfast with my daughter and then I want to tuck her in at night. And if mm-hmm. I can keep and so I've tr- I've worked really hard to orient my business. And we had this conversation our, uh, last week. Um, mm-hmm. When when you invited me, uh, so kind to invite me out to out to Austin, and I said, you know, my, my radius is sixty miles, <laughs> right? And and exactly. Austin is just a little bit outside of that sixty mile radius. Exactly. Um, so yeah. you know, I thought that was funny because you've seen that channel or the TV show TMZ. Yeah. TMZ stands for thirty mile zone, and that's you know like a thirty mile area at, in Hollywood where no yeah. one goes out, like all the actors and actresses. Yeah. Are. So I was like. Doug, Doug doubles down. He goes 60 miles zone, <laughs> and it's around, it's around his house. <laughs> yeah, 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 and, yeah. But I love it because, and after I hung up the phone with you, I was like, that is pretty fantastic because uh, yeah. if, if, for your business to be like a more one-on-one type of mentorship uh, spurring business, it is important to have that close community. And so one of the things I've spent a lot of time thinking and talking about on this podcast and elsewhere is like... Uh, community and tribe and you know they say uh, fish school birds flock and people tribe yeah and proximity in a lot of ways is is how you handle that so i love that so was that was that informed by anything other than you just you wanting to you know be home at certain times to be with family or is that something that is deeper um it yes and no so so the biggest part i would say was just wanting to be home like right. I just I want to spend time with my wife, I want to spend time with my kid. Right. Um, the the other part was man I live in one of the greatest cities, in my opinion. I, living in Raleigh is like the greatest because we've got a we've got a great economy, we've got a strong housing market, uh, we've got growing businesses, we've got the research triangle here. Um, mm-hmm. There's no reason to fly all around the country. There's enough business here for me to work my entire life and not get it all done. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like there's no there's there's nothing for me in Phoenix. This not for, for here you know what I mean? This here in Raleigh. Right. So so that was the other part of it. And then and then and then the last part is dude, I'm six seven. I don't fit in airplanes very well. You know what I mean? Like flying just sucks. <laughs> I'm six three and I don't fit in airplanes. Yeah, at it's ter- all. it's terrible. It's terrible. It's terrible. And and we my wife and I have been told that we have a codependent relationship. It's like, like we're we're married and we're also best friends, so we spend right. a lot of time together. And so I've changed that. I like to say we have an interdependent relationship, where okay. we where we choose to spend a lot of time together and be around <laughs> each other a lot. And uh, man, I just I just like to be home. Like, like I woke yeah. up this morning and, and got a got a bunch of stuff done, and uh, I I live just between two lakes. And so I, so I jumped out for 45 minutes and did a little paddleboarding session and came home and now we're doing this. Like, this is the greatest life of all time. Like, I couldn't imagine do it. Like, what, what's for me outside of the city limits? Like, there's enough for me here. And, and there's, and there's frankly enough people for me to help here. Um, Another, another thing we talk about when it comes to technology is, is the more pervasive technology becomes, the more valuable human, human connection is. Right. And and if I'm going to teach people about human connection, I might as well be a demonstration of that. Exactly. I, I think that's key. Um, and so we're kind of hitting our time here. So like um, I, I love that. And, and the thing is, it all started from this moment where you were saying, OK, I've got to take responsibility for myself. And so two seconds ago, you said this is the perfect life. And if you contrast that with where we started, which was. Hey, I've got to make some major changes. I don't know what's wrong. I've got to take an inventory. Yeah. And so if the Doug Stewart story tells me one thing, it's look in the mirror, take a take an inventory, figure out where I can own my own potential and what I can do to change it. Yeah. And you've done awesome things since you made that call, man. So I, I love the story. I love hanging out and talking with you. Yeah, uh, let's Let's make it a regular thing. Oh, and one other thing I did want to ask about is like, uh, you've got you've got your own podcast. It's called Off the Top, right? Can yep, you tell us yep. about that? Yeah. So so Off the Top is um, is really a selfish endeavor. So I've got a, I've got a buddy. His name's Mark Kinsley. He's a he's a vice president of marketing at a at a 
pretty good sized company called Leggett and Platt. They're they make components for for the bedding industry and a, and a lot of other places. The huge and, business, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so so Mark is is one of the most like creative, most interesting people that I've that I've had the privilege to work with and around. Mm-hmm. And so every month we would have like this this amazing conversation about like what he's up to, what I'm up to, and like talk, like help each other work through like this our creative process. And so I thought, like, how can I get, how can I create an environment where we do this more often? And then mm-hmm. how can I share that? And so I called him one day and I said, hey, bro, like, what, what would you think about doing a weekly podcast? And he was like, what would it be about? And I said, I don't know. Let's just like, <laughs> like, just off the top of our head, just topics. And he goes, well, what if we call it off the top? I was like, sweet. And he goes, I'll do the art. And I said, cool, I'll, um, I'll buy the subscription to SoundCloud. And we just have it, like, we have no idea what we're going to talk about every week. Uh Um, and we just get on and say, yo, what's up? And we have these great conversations and, um, we've, 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 I think we've built a pretty good community and we're scratching our own itch. Um, you know, people ask me how many people listen and I tell them I have no clue. Um, I know a lot of people will send me messages, um, but I don't, I don't check because I, I want it to just, I want it to serve the original purpose, which is. Um, to to be creative in the world and then give other people an opportunity to participate in that, and um, so that spun a couple of other, a couple of other projects. I've got another podcast called Mastering Mentorship. That's mm-hmm. essentially about that concept of mentorship. How do we learn from everything and everyone around us? I've right. got another project coming out called um, Defying the Desert, uh, Finding the Oasis in Every Human, which is really like a, a one-on-one coaching manifesto okay. um, that I'm actually starting recording on Thursday. I love um, the fact that you use the word manifesto often, like two times in an hour because I hear that word probably once a year. Yeah. I just got a double dose here. I love that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's <laughs> it's 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 really interesting. I'm I'm finding and here's here's something I'm testing and this is something that 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 you may find interesting or or okay. or maybe able to tell you tell me why it it won't work. Mm-hmm. So I'm I I am as as you know, I'm highly dyslexic. So writing is not my thing. Um, I feel like I've probably got three or four books I could have already written if right. if I would have had a capacity to actually write them. And so spoken word is the way that I, I'm able to communicate most effectively. Right. And so I started my podcast. Those are going well. And so I got this idea, like, what if I just, like, gave my concept or my book in audio only? Right. So this Defying the Desert is the first, the first project. And so I'm going to release it all at one time, like a, like a Netflix series. Right, right, right. right. 16 chapters done. And like an likely, audio book, essentially. Yes, yeah, an audio book. It's an Can audio you get book. it transcribed and get it in print? I probably won't. All right, we'll talk about that later, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, because because it's it's not something I'm doing to make money. It's something I'm doing to scratch my itch and be creative. Um, I, I I have I have my for profit stuff, mm-hmm. and there's there's a part of me that really wants to just contribute to my community, and right. to 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 give away as much as I can. So one of the things I think about a lot is how how can I provide for my family in a meaningful way, and and then how much? And then how much can I give away? Right. Those are the two most important things for me. Well, doggone it, Doug Stewart, you're a rare human being. Thanks for coming on, man. It's beautiful. If you, I'll put the links on for any uh, of the existing projects you have out now with this, um, and we'll take it from there, man. Thanks for coming cool. on. Thanks for having me. See ya.